Titled it uh, Electromagnetician, Genius in Britain. Now, electromagnetician was a term uh, given to heavy side by uh, George Searle, who was a Cambridge physicist from 1875 to around 1950. And he described Oliver Heavy Side as an electromagnetician because of the work that he did throughout his life. So let's get started. Now, I'm going to ask a question first. Um, has, anyone, has anyone actually heard of Oliver Heaviside before? Yes. Um, does anyone only know Heaviside because of the Heaviside step function? <laughs> I thought it was. So today I'm going to try and change people's view on Heaviside and maybe tell you a little bit more about it myself. So that's Heaviside there. Uh, he had red hair. He was born in 1850. And he was around until 1925, where he died in Torquay Devon. This picture at the side here is actually a castle in Devon, in Torquay, um, where him and his family used to always go for holidays. And ever since birth to his death, he used to always visit there. He used to cycle around there with I eminent mean, visitors to the town. So, so uh, people from Cambridge used to actually come and visit every side and go cycling around there with him. His father was right in the centre there, with a nice big beard. <coughs> and the best of his family. Now, Heaviside was actually the youngest of four, so he had four brothers um, in varying careers. One of them was an electrical engineer, worked for the post office. His father was actually a wood engraver from Stockton on Tees, so that isn't far from here. Um, his mother was a, a governess, and they moved to London in 1849 because the development of photography in the mid-1800s meant that wood carvers weren't as in high demand, but in London, you could still get paid a pretty high price for good wood engraving. So they moved to London, and Heaviside was actually born in 1850, a year later. His uncle was to Charles Woodstone, so I'm guessing everyone knows about the Woodstone Bridge, which wasn't actually invented by Charles, he only popularised it. It was invented by another chap. And he's sometimes referred to as the grandfather of telegraphy back in the very early 1800s. When he was a child, Heaviside developed scarlet fever. It didn't look like he was actually going to make it. He was going to survive. Uh, but he did survive, thankfully. And, um, but he did have partial deafness and quite acute hearing loss uh, for the rest of his life, which might have actually helped to hinder his career. He left school at 16. He was a good student. Um, I think fifth out of 100. But he, he is a record saying once that um, teaching of geometry to um, kids under 16 was barbarous. Um, which might be true, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, so when he left school at 16, his uncle, Sir Charles Whitstone, um, decided, well, not decided, but persuaded him to do some further study into Danish language and electromagnetism. So he spent two years on electromagnetism and telegraphy. Um, so that's quite a long time just to sit in your room doing some self-study on, on electromagnetics. Um, because it's entirely self-taught every side. And after two years, he went to work at the Great Northern Telegraph Company. Firstly, he moved to Denmark, where he was a telegraph operator. And then he moved to Newcastle as a chief uh, telegraph operator with the same company. And throughout his roles as operator and chief operator, he was known as a problem solver. <coughs> he used to come up with simple ideas to fix apparatus or to make apparatus better. And he was given great esteem by his peers, um, who praised for all his work. That they ultimately accumulated in some research papers when he was 21 and 22, okay. which is probably similar to the first year PhD student of the day. But bearing in mind, he never went to university and he was all uh, self self-taught, so he had to teach himself all the higher mathematics himself, and also all the theory of electromagnetism that was known to date. 
he actually found uh, the very famous work by Maxwell, um, treatise on electricity and magnetism in Newcastle Library in 1873. When he got that book, he saw how great it could be, or was, and he quit his job and decided to go back into full-time study. Um, so he moved back home into his parents' house, locked himself away for quite a number of years to try and master Maxwell's book. And throughout this whole time, he was a very keen cyclist. Now, <coughs> I'm sure a lot of people in the room recognise these as Maxwell's equations. Um, however, these aren't Maxwell's equations. Maxwell, Maxwell's theory um, of electromagnetism was based in coordinates, which means that it's not a vector form. If you think of a complex number, but in three-dimensional space, um, which was originally formulated by Hamilton, which is a Cambridge mathematician. Um, Maxwell formulated his theory in the two volumes of um, electricity and magnetism in this mathematical formalism. But Maxwell himself was under pressure to simplify it because the, the actual manipulation of that kind of mathematics was clumsy, or deemed to be clumsy, and not really suitable for physical applications. So Maxwell had 20 equations and 20 unknowns all in that form, um, which he used creating the um, potentials and also scalar potentials. Now, uh, Henry Side come along in 1892, which is sometime after <coughs> that was uh, sometime after Maxwell's work, after he cracked Maxwell's work. Uh, Henry Side also once said that after you put Maxwell's work away, he started to work on it himself. He made much faster progress than actually trying to work out what Maxwell was doing. So from the top there, you see that we've got uh, Gauss's law for electric fields. Uh, down from there, we have Faraday's law. Down from that, we have Gauss's law for magnetic, and then also Ampere's law. So these are the first time that these equations were actually formed as a set of four in vector form. So the very first time. So that's quite a big achievement to reduce 20 equations and 20 unknowns, put them in a brand new form with four equations that can be solved to describe the whole of electromagnetism in a set of four equations. The only difference between what we use now and what Heaviside used is that Heaviside um, didn't discount the possibility of a magnetic current. Now we know that there's no such thing as a magnetic current as an electric current. So if you have a look at the terms here, the, the curl of the E field we normally take to be the time differential of the H field. But here, heavy side for symmetry with Ampere's law um, has included a, a magnetic current there, which he put there just for generality. So beside remodeling Maxwell's equations into what I call the heavy side equations, he also done a lot of work on telegraphy. So he, he was the first person to use a differential element uh, transmission line model. So up until that day, everyone used lump element um, transmission line models, which are really, really bad, essentially uh, calculating long transmission lines. So he derived these set of partial differential equations, which he then applied um, to transmission lines. He was the first person to do this. And from this, he was actually able to derive what we call the heavy side condition, or this, the distortionist condition which means that if the ratio of the conductance of the capacitance is equal to the ratio of the resistance to the inductance of the transmission line, we can actually have a transmission line where the signal input is undistorted from the signal output. So that, that doesn't mean no loss, that just means it's distortionless. And whereas if you had a, a telegraphy system where, say, you could do 50, 50 characters per minute before, with the distortionless condition, you could probably do 500 characters per minute. And that was a quite a big achievement in them days. So besides the differential element uh, transmission line, everyone will probably recognise this as something we did with Laplace transforms. Uh, so using operational methods to calculate solutions for differential equations. Heavy side actually done this before everyone started using Laplace transforms to do the same thing. When he was used to solve electric circuits, he used to write down the descriptive differential equations, um, assign these operators. So he used to use P for the derivative, 1 over P for the integral. 
um, and then solve the differential equation algebraically based on zone rotation. And there's a little bit of controversy with the mathematical people of the day because they used to have fractional um, differentiation and fractional integration. So you can have fractional powers of p, which at the time people didn't think was very good. But then the guy would come along called Gromich, um, which actually verified his idea after, after Heaviside died. Um, so the work that Heaviside done wasn't really acknowledged until after his death. He was the first person to use vectors in electromagnetics, and he also complex numbers in engineering, so everyone knows impedance and resistance plus the complex operator times the reactants. He was the first person to do that. And besides all the theoretical work that he'd that he done, it was quite a lot. <coughs> These two things here were things that he probably could have painted, but at the time he didn't because he was busy up in his bedroom and his mum's house working on electromagnetics. Um, on the left, we have uh, loading coils. So the distortionless condition that comes out of Maxwell, um, sorry, Heaviside's theory um, of the transmission line, what he'd done was he put uh, high inductance coils distributed along the transmission line in order to actually achieve the distortionless condition in practice. And then on the right, we have a coaxial cable, which has been used since um, Heaviside invented in 1881, right up until now, essentially, um, for <coughs> communications. I mean, probably some of the lines in here are probably still using coaxial cable for um, television aerials, things like that. So instead of just being a pure theoretician, he also done practical things. And that's one small example of the kind of things that he done, but didn't paint. Now, in 1902, um, we moved from transmission lines guided by the waveguide, essentially, so a coaxial cable, etc. We actually predicted um, a layer in the ionosphere that would reflect medium wave uh, radio frequency uh, transmissions so that we could broadcast beyond the horizon. And this was at the same time as Kenley, um, but it's quite possible that Kenley read Heaviside's work and they come to the same conclusion at the same time based on that work. Just a quick, that's some of the words that everyone uses today that um, people might not know where they came from. So admittance, conductance, electorate. So that's uh, something that exhibits quasi-permanent electric charge rod and permanent magnet. Impedance, inductance, permeability, admittance, reluctance. Everyone still uses them today, but no one knows where they come from. Uh, but if you read Heaviside's work, you can see all the reasoning behind why he chose them words. <coughs> he wrote a, a, quite a vast number of works. So his first one, 1892, Electrical Papers, which was a collection of academic papers that he wrote. Electromagnetic Theory, Volume 1, Volume 2. The whole book on electromagnetic waves in Vector mm. 4. Electromagnetic Theory, Volume 2, 3, and possibly the fourth. But the fourth was actually stolen. The manuscript was not published and was stolen from his house um, just before he died. And the rumour at the time was that Heaviside had actually um, achieved unification of gravity and electromagnetism, which people are actually still trying to do today. Heaviside read um, Einstein's work. He didn't think it was very, very good. Now, everyone probably would laugh at that. But um, there's been a lot of people recently and also in the past that haven't thought that Einstein was 100% correct or thought of alternative ways of expressing what Einstein has done. So it's possible that Heaviside had come up with his own version of what Einstein had come up with. He also published countless academic papers in the electrician and also the proceedings of the Royal Society, which were the two big journals really, of the day. Now, he was quite a difficult man. Um, he had quite a few high-ranking friends. So on the side, we've got James Clark Maxwell, who corresponded with. Um, we've got Hertz, Thompson, and Oliver Lodge. They were all people that decided to visit Heaviside and sort of advocate his work, worked with him, corresponded with him, supported him financially. Because as, as he never had a really job throughout his whole life, apart from the two years he worked for the Great Northern Telegraph Company, um, had no income apart from that, that was donated to him. But there was one man, this is William Priest, who at one time was the president of the Institution of Telegraph Engineers, 
also the institution of the civil engineers and was the chief engineer of the post office and also editor of the electrician uh, journal that he used to publish it. Um, Priests used to always try and discount Heaviside's work, basically because Heaviside used to try and discount his work. Priest um, was not a very distinguished mathematician or electrical engineer, in fact. Um, he got there through money and people who that he knew. So for Heaviside to come along, he didn't see him as a very good um, person of engineering because he was self-taught, and at that time, he was self-taught. He didn't have all the background that, say, a Cambridge mathematician or physicist would have. He didn't exactly get the academic street cred that he would uh, rightly deserve. So, closing to the end, nearly now, in his, he was even more eccentric in his later years. For example, he signed Worm after his name, um, because that's how he thought society perceived him, as some sort of worm or leech on society. Um, which I think is unfair. He replaced all his furniture with granite blocks. Some people say that might be a good thing for his back, but might be a bit cold in the winter. He painted his fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> I hope no one does that with you. Um, he died in Torquay, Devon, <laughs> in, on the 3rd of February 1925. He's a very poor man. Um, so he, at the end of his years, he, he died alone didn't have very much money, with not much recognition of all the work that he'd achieved throughout his life. And I, I don't think that's a very good thing, considering all the things that we still we still use by him today. And if you look at his gravestone, he's buried in a grave with his mother and his father. And that's a recent photograph. It's not very prestigious for a person who's really shaped and changed electrical engineering and electromagnetics, um, I think. I think he deserves something a little bit better than that. So, Heaviside, I've told you a little bit more about him. British self-taught mathematician, an electromagnetician, fellow of the Royal Society, member of the Institute of Telegraph Engineers and the Electrical Engineers as it was at the time. He was the first person to win the Faraday Medal. He made a significant contribution to electrical engineering, electromagnetics, mathematics and physics. He was a bit controversial, had an impish personality, a bit misunderstood, he received mostly posthumous recognition for his work. And at the bottom there, I think this is 1964, they unveiled a plaque outside his old house, the, that's the IEEE at the time, um, to commemorate Heaviside's work. Now this, this is a little bit of fun. Um, a little bit embarrassing for me because I'm going to recite this for you guys. So, heavy side wrote, wrote this. Um, self induction's in the air, everywhere, everywhere. Waves are running to and fro. Here they are, there they go. Try and stop them if you can, you British engineering man. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions for Chris? I've got one. Have you? Um, why did he choose to learn Danish of all the languages? Danish is a strange. Because at the time when they were um, putting subsea telegraph cables, yeah. they were stringing them from um, Newcastle and Denmark. Okay. So that was the main reason, just so that he could use the language in which he could be using it. Yeah. I particularly like the last slide you yeah. had post bonus recognition. Yes, post <laughs> I don't know what post bonus recognition is, but well, that's what you get for writing slides at 11 o'clock at night. Is there any more questions from anyone? Neil? Um.